Hello everybody, so thank you for joining me today and in today's video we're going to be looking at the high yield head traumas for final exams. So just a brief introduction about the Medicine Guide. So the Medicine Guide is a YouTube channel with free online videos to help support students throughout their entire medical school journey. So I've got videos on how to be successful in medical school, how to approach anatomy, CBL, histology and PBL. I've also got videos focusing on the high yield topics that crop up in final exams, such as the high yield imaging edition, knobs and gynae edition, paediatrics edition, cardiology edition, and this video in conjunction with others makes up my high yield neurology edition. So let's get started. So in today's video, we're going to be looking at the high yield head traumas that crop up in medical school final exams. So in particular, we're going to be focusing on extradural hemorrhage, an acute subdural hemorrhage, chronic subdural hemorrhage, intracerebral hemorrhage, and finally an intraventricular hemorrhage. So if you have a look at the picture on the far right hand side, the pathologies that are enclosed within a purple box are the pathologies that we'll be discussing today. Now, subarachnoid hemorrhage can arise from trauma as well, but I've previously covered that in my high yield headache for finals video. So if you want to find out a little bit more about subarachnoid hemorrhage, then please do have a look at that video. So let's get started with today's video. Okay, so initially we're going to be looking at an extradural hemorrhage. Something to bear in mind is that sometimes in textbooks you might hear the phrase epidural hemorrhage. So epidural hemorrhage and extradural hemorrhage are terms that are used interchangeably and they both refer to the same pathology. So essentially you've got arterial blood which is collecting between the skull and the dura and this arterial blood is due to the rupture of the middle meningeal artery which overlies the terion. So let's have a look at the risk factors for developing an extradural hemorrhage. So classically, it arises from a low impact trauma, which fractures the terion, and then this will rupture the middle meningeal artery. So classically in an SBA, it usually gives an example where a patient's been hit on the side of the head with a cricket bat, and so that blunt trauma will rupture the terion, so the terion is the thin, weak bone which overlies the junction of the greater wing of the sphenoid bone, the squamous portion of the temporal bone, the parietal bone and the frontal bone. So if you have a look at the picture on the far right upper corner, hopefully you can appreciate that. But the key thing to remember is you have a blunt trauma which fractures the terion, rupturing the middle meningeal artery so arterial blood will collect between the skull and the dura mater. So that's the key pathology to remember. In terms of signs and symptoms, you need, to be, you need to remember that the patient will initially lose the consciousness after this blunt, low impact head trauma. Then they will temporarily recover. So this is what's described as the lucid interval, but they will rapidly decline in their GCS status. So you've got an initial loss of consciousness after the head trauma, then this temporary recovery, so it's lucid interval, and then a rapid decline in mental status. And another key classic feature of an extradural hemorrhage is the third nerve palsy. So a third nerve palsy is when the eye appears in a down and out position. The patient will experience ptosis, that's droopiness of the upper eyelid, and the patient will have a fixed dilated pupil. Okay. Now, in terms of the tests and investigations needed for an extradural hemorrhage, this is something that's very high yield and you definitely need to keep in mind when you're revising this topic. So you need to perform a non-contrast CT head and the classic sign of an extradural hemorrhage on a CT scan is that the patient will present with this lentiform or lemon sign and hemorrhage will be limited by the patient's suture line. So let's have a look at CT head. So hopefully, if you have a look in the bottom right hand corner, you can see an example of this lemon sign or lentiform sign. So essentially that's describing the arterial blood, which is collecting between the skull and the dura mater, and it's pushing down on the dura mater, and therefore it creates this lentiform or lemon sign on a CT head. And classically, the hemorrhage is limited by suture lines. So those are 
two really key high yield phrases that crop up in SBAs, and that's why I've highlighted them and underlined them in the bold blue font. So please keep that in mind. And in terms of managing these patients, an extratural hemorrhage is an example of a neurological emergency. So we need to perform a prior temporal craniotomy and then perform evacuation of the hematoma. Okay. So now we're going to be looking at an acute subdural hemorrhage. Now, a subdural hemorrhage is when you've got rupture of the bridging veins. So risk factors involves AV malformations, high impact trauma. So classically in the SBA, these patients will present following a fall after suffering from an epileptic fit or following from a road traffic accident. So in terms of signs and symptoms, these patients will experience fluctuating consciousness or drowsiness, headache and incontinence. Now in terms of tests, again, a non-contrast CT head is vital. And classically, these patients will present with a hyperdense crescentic or concave collection of blood. And the hemorrhage is not limited by suture lines and you really need to be aware of that because you'll often be given a CT head in the exam and you'll have to understand whether or not the patient is presenting with a subdural hemorrhage or potentially an extra hemorrhage based on the CT head alone. So let's have a look at the CT. So essentially with a subdural hemorrhage you've got essentially what's known as this banana sign or this crescentic concave collection. So if you have a look at the CT head in the far right up corner, and if you have a look at the CT in the far bottom right hand corner, hopefully you'll begin to appreciate this banana sign or this crescentic concave collection. Okay, and please remember that it's venous blood because you've got rupture of the bridging veins. So in terms of management, initially we can offer conservative management, but the definitive treatment is to monitor the patient's intracranial pressure and to perform a decompressive craniotomy. Okay, and that's for an acute subdural hemorrhage. So now let's look at a chronic subdural hemorrhage. So a chronic subdural hemorrhage is when you've got an old collection of venous blood found between the dura and the raphoid matter, and this has persisted for many weeks and many months because the small fragile bridging veins have ruptured. So in terms of risk factors, so it typically presents an SBA in an elderly patient who has fused alcohol or is taking anticoagulation medication. Chronic subdural hemorrhage can also present as part of shaken baby syndrome, so that's something else to keep in mind. But classically, an SBA for chronic subdural hemorrhage involves an elderly patient who is fusing alcohol and is receiving anticoagulation medication. Now in terms of signs, so fairly similar to an acute subdural hemorrhage, so the loss of consciousness, headache, and the key thing to remember in a chronic subdural hemorrhage is that these patients will have progressive confusion and these patients are presenting several weeks or months after the initial mild head injury, okay? And in terms of tests and investigations, similarly again, we need to be very aware and comfortable in interpreting non-contrast CT heads. So again, because it's a subdural hemorrhage, these patients will present with this crescentic concave collection around the brain, so classically this banana sign. The hemorrhage is not limited by suture lines. Now the key thing to remember in a chronic subdural hemorrhage is that the collection of blood is hypodense. Okay, now we need to look at the management. So again, conservative management, and the definitive treatment for chronic subdural hemorrhage is to perform surgical decompression with bare hole drainage. Okay. So now let's look at an intracerebral hemorrhage. So an intracerebral hemorrhage is when blood is collecting within the brain, typically the basal ganglia and the internal capsule. So you've got blood collecting within the brain parenchyma itself. So the risk factors of an intracerebral hemorrhage involves hypertension, aneurysms, AV malformations, and also a cerebral, cerebral amyloid angiopathy. So these patients will present with reduced consciousness or a reduced GCS score. And because this patient is experiencing hemorrhage, so a bleed within the brain 
parenchyma itself, these patients can present with a hemorrhagic stroke. So in terms of tests, we need to do a non-contrast CT head, which shows hyperdensity within the brain parenchyma, so within the substance of the brain. So let's have a look at the CT head. So hopefully you can appreciate that there is a hyperdensity within the brain parenchyma. And the management of these patients involves conservative management by stroke physicians, because these patients could be presenting with a hemorrhagic stroke. And surgical evacuation is something that we would consider. So surgical evacuation is used more ideally where patients have got large clots and they've got an impaired consciousness or a very poor GCS score. And another thing to keep in mind is that a prothrombin complex is used as emergency reversal of anticoagulation therapy in patients who are presenting with a head injury or severe bleeding. Okay. Now let's look at an intraventricular hemorrhage. So the risk factors of an intraventricular hemorrhage is that this occurs unfortunately in premature neonates. That's something to keep in mind because it classically presents in an SBA. In terms of signs and symptoms, so this occurs spontaneously in premature neonates and it typically develops within the first 72 hours of birth or the first 72 hours of life. Again, we need to be very comfortable in interpreting non-contrast CT heads because these patients will present with a hyperdensity within the dark CSF spaces in their ventricles. So let's have a look at the non-contrast CT head in the bottom right hand corner. So hopefully you can see that there's quite a collection of blood. So this lighter grey area found within the ventricles themselves. OK. And Another thing to bear in mind is that when we're performing a non-contrast CT head, we also want to exclude for an obstructive hydrocephalus as well. Because an obstructive hydrocephalus is one of the main complications or the main concerns that we need to consider in these patients. And in terms of managing these patients, we can perform a surgical CSF diversion to alleviate the obstructive hydrocephalus if the patient does have an obstructive hydrocephalus. As a complication and shunting can be performed to alleviate the hydrocephalus and also to alleviate the rising intracranial pressure okay so thank you for watching my video today hopefully you found it useful uh, please could I ask you to like my video and subscribe to my youtube channel if you found it useful and beneficial today I wish you all the best with your exams and thank you very much for watching today